I love Italian. This is Italian white bread. I love Italian white bread. Yeah, you're not having that. You're having this. So what? Hey, Tom here, Flip Anything USA. So on my blog, I share how I made my fortune, starting at 19 years old, millionaire by 28. Did it all with real estate, and uh, I urge anybody that's out there wanting to uh, make more money uh, in a different field, uh, choose real estate. It's the easiest, fastest, quickest way. So anyways, today we're going to take a look at uh, Ben Mala. Actually, Ben Mala Jr., I think. I don't know if it's Ben, but it's his son. Uh, and this is called $5.3 million deal. Uh, on the Life, Life for Sale series. Anyhow, uh, Ben's whole family is kind of involved with him on real estate. And I think this is his eldest son uh, is scrutinizing a $5.3 million purchase uh, commercial strip center, something that I also own quite a few of. In fact, I just bought one here last week uh, for about $3 million. And uh, there are a set of uh, checks that you go through, and I thought we'd take a look and see what uh, Ben Jr. is doing. And uh, I'll compare notes. Take a look. So, hey, before we get into this, uh, please uh, hit that subscribe button, hit that like button, comment if you would. Uh, you can follow me on social media. We've got uh, Instagram and Facebook out there, and uh, always interested in what any of you have to see or what you want to hear. Uh, and let's keep let's get watching. We're here at Panera. It's an Outback, it's a Panera, a glazing place, financial advisor, and a food store. We need to inspect this place 100% so that we know every skeleton in the closet. So I gotta be my ass out here today and find everything about the property today because we're closing on this thing probably in 10, 15 days. This is a quick find, quick buy, and we gotta move quickly. So I can tell you that's one thing I always preach to all the people in my class uh, is you gotta move fast. You always wanna be the first one there. If you can't be first, be there second, waiting for number one to slip up. Uh, so now we're out here quickly inspecting the place to make sure everything's okay. So I, right off the bat, see, he's taking a look. He's taking a picture of this uh, uh, inspection sticker of a sort up on the uh, hood. I can tell you one thing when it comes to uh, uh, kitchens inside your properties for commercial kitchens and things, uh, they have to be clean. That one looks really clean, by the way. This is probably Panera Bread. But you want to make sure that they have a schedule that they're cleaning. Because let me tell you, uh, the grease buildup that goes inside those things and the grease fires that potentially can happen, uh, you'll see if you ever own a commercial strip center, you'll find out quickly that your insurance company is very interested in the kitchen. Uh, they want to make sure that the, the hood is being cleaned regularly and it's something you want to look at too as a buyer let's keep watching so i brought mike bonus mike knows about retail he's in construction he's 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 done build outs for me he knows roofs he knows electrical system he knows about efis that i don't know about and i need my team without my team i don't know shit yeah i can tell you right now i'm a pretty handy guy i've been involved with construction my whole life so i am my own inspector but if you're out there if you don't no, if you're not particularly handy or particularly experienced, you better find someone like what he's got. You better have somebody that knows what they're doing with you. It's just, it's crucial. See that sprinkler right there? The cup's missing around it. That's a violation of fire code. Even though the tenant is responsible for everything inside this place, you know, we still have to double check everything because if this tenant moves out, then we're going to be responsible for releasing this place. And look at every single square inch of this place. We have to look at the fire rooms. We have to look at the elevator rooms. We got to look inside every office, inside every bathroom. What are you guys, scared to get in the elevator? Come on, Come bro. on, show Actually, the elevator is another certificate you need to check. The first thing I see with the roof is that I hear creaks in it which means the underlayment might be a little bit loose. That doesn't mean that it's leaking, it just means that it might be a little loose. He's a pretty big boy. He might get some creaks that, that some of us wouldn't get. Not, not coming on the way, but these are pretty big guys. Uh, but he is making a, a valid point. You can even see these wrinkles beyond him uh, way over here. You can see it right here. It, it, when you, These on the side here aren't so critical, but when they're on the ground here, uh, as soon as somebody steps on them, they fracture and then they become, uh, you know, a, a portal for water to come into the building. It's a mark, but it's got a good pitch. And what he just said about it having a good pitch, that's real important too. Whether you got a flat roof, a lot of people don't realize a flat roof is really like a bowl. It's like a bowl. And 
the water runs to the drain. Uh, you, you don't want it run into scuppers. I mean, if some, some are a little bit domed and they go to scuppers, they call them scuppers or cutouts that run out the side, also important. But it's real important to have fall. You have to have fall toward the drain or you have to have fall toward the scuppers or if it all runs off the back, you definitely want a good pitch. So it's something to be aware of. See, now this is the beginning of delamination. So it already had a patch on it. So you got to identify these type of issues, these bubbles immediately, cut them out and put a new patch on it so that it seals to the underlayment perfectly. Yeah, he's right about that, 100%. And he's, he, he identified as a problem, a potential problem. It probably doesn't leak right now, but it's something that, that could soon. We're going to get our roofer out here to find out exactly if the roof's good. We're going to do a core test. Basically, the roofer comes in, he drills down into the core of the whole roof, makes a hole in it, then you get to see all the layers of the roof. So, yeah, I don't even know that a core, I don't know that I would do a core on that, to be quite honest. But one thing that I would do is I do what, what we call a flood test. And if you don't know what a flood test is, it's basically just what it sounds like. You take a hose up on the roof. If you have a drain that that uh, a drain that the water runs to, or if it's running to the scuppers on the outside, you'll either block the scuppers and you'll start filling the roof with water. Or if it's got a drain, you plug the drain. And what you do is you you raise the water. It's also a good way of diagnosing for leaks, of course, which is what you'd be doing. But it's also if you've ever have a leak on a property you need to fix, well, you can't fix it in the rain usually. So you come back when it's dry. And what you do is you do a flood test. And basically you plug the drain on top of the roof and then you just start filling it with water. And maybe once you get and it'll do that. It'll, it'll be like a big pool that just concentrically gets bigger because it should have flow right to it. And after you get maybe half the roof flooded or a third of the roof flooded around the drain, you can stop and then maybe wait 30, 40 minutes, then go inside and see if you see a leak. Okay, if you don't see a leak, then you mark around that outside edge of your circle, just a mark on each end, just so you have a, a whereabouts where you left off. And you go, okay, there's no leaks. Water to that point, no leaks. Then you run water again for another hour or so, whatever it takes, and then your pool gets even bigger, covers more of the roof, and then again, you stop the water, you mark it, it's not, the water's not going anywhere because you have the drain plugged. And now you wait another 30, 40 minutes and you look, you do that till you fill the entire roof. But what's nice about that is let's say that after, you know, you did the first okay. fill and then you did the second fill and then you wait 30 minutes and you start to see a leak. Well, now you've isolated the leak. You know that the leak is within that, the, the smaller concentric circle and the larger concentric circle. So it's in between there. So now you know where the leak is. You can... Otherwise, what will happen is if you just flood the whole roof, you don't know where the water's coming from. It could be leaking here and coming this way and then dripping. So but by doing the concentric circles and the flood test, you isolate your leaks, and it's just a smart thing to do. Who owns the problem. hole in the parking lot? Are you going to put a hot tub in there? Or something? <laughs> That's what I'm wondering. Well, I got car, we got car damage from it. I hope the new owners, you guys are new owners, are better than the old owners and better property managers because they're completely unresponsive so far. Okay. All right, so I hope the, hopefully it'll improve. I tell you, that's always nice when you're looking at a property and the tenants start coming out and say, are you the new owner? And they start telling you the problems. And then you get an idea of, of some of the problems that things have been neglected. It's happened to me many times. Uh, but this guy obviously isn't shy about telling you. That, and you know, and let me tell you where this here the breakdown is. And I think Ben and his family is like mine. In other words, I'm very, very close to the tenants. I, I am a part of the management and the maintenance. I'm like in the... I'm in the know all the time. When you hire an outside agency to manage your property, these are the kind of problems that happen. What this guy's talking about, how their people aren't responsive and they don't do a good job and they're not, you know, he hopes the new owners do better. It's because he doesn't know the owner. He probably just knows the management company that manages the property for the owner. And as a result, you get poor, poor service. Anyways, happens all the time. But the closer you can get to the owner of the property, the closer the owner is to the management like I am, and I, I believe like Ben, Ben's group is, uh, you're more responsive and you take care of your tenants. So uh, this is this is good for them, for what they, from what I'm hearing. This is good. It's good. It's good. He put the water cooler there. I like that guy. That guy I like already. I like him. He's no bullshit. He'll get along good with us. Yeah, actually, it's funny. And I would like a tenant like that, too. I've actually literally had the bumper ripped off a, of a car on one of my properties because uh, somebody had dug something out like that and let it go. It was much worse than that. And, uh, yeah. Uh, anyways, somebody needed a new bumper. I think we took care of it too. But uh, anyways, you got to watch out for stuff like that. Even if even if you got to get over there and just fill it, just fill it with anything. I mean, you can fill that with concrete too, by the way. But 
something like that. You do not want to sit. He's no bullshit. He'll get along good with us because we don't play that bullshit, non-responsive and all that. You call my cell phone, I'm here. And so that's great. I mean, that's exactly how I operate. And by the way, uh, I operate primarily with text. If you tell your tenants, have your tenants text you the problems. Don't call. Don't leave a voicemail. Have them text you. Train your tenants to give you a text. It's the best thing you can possibly do because A, the most important thing they'll text first and the second most important thing. And if there's something that's not very important, it'll never make it on the text. You know, like I need to get cool or AC doesn't work. Hey, the gas is out. You know, you'll, you'll get the most important stuff immediately. It's the way to do it. And then plus so you can then take that text and resend it back out to the tenant and whatever trade, whether it's an AC man, electrician, you know, fire sprinkler guy, whatever, uh, you, you got them all in the same loop and then you can kind of keep an eye from your phone about what's going on. Let's keep watching. Those, see the drains? Yeah. There's, there's water getting in that wood. We bad. have to replace that stuff? It's exterior. It's you. That's easy fix then. Yeah, yeah pretty much with, in a triple net lease like they're describing. Uh, and, and there's, listen, it's all over the place. You can make it, like I have bars that they're 100% responsible for the air conditioners, replacing the air conditioners, everything, 100%. Schools, same thing. Uh, a restaurant, what sometimes is typical is you, you have a, an, an agreement that if the AC goes out, you'll pay 50%, they pay 50%, but they're, they're responsible for 100% of the maintenance. It's important when a chain like that, they have to be responsible for the maintenance for their own good. They don't want to have to call me and have to rely on me to call somebody else to take care of it. They got customers, they got people they got to take care of. So maintenance is a big part of their overhead and it's a part of their fixed overhead that they expect to have in order to maintain continuity of the restaurant. This one's a 6.8. You're going to get a better cap rate on this one because the leases are expiring soon. So Panera has an option, but they don't. we don't know if they're going to take that option. Outback has an option, but we don't know if they're going to take that option. So we're getting a higher cap rate on this place because there's a chance that all these people could move out. Yeah, so if you don't follow, they basically, they've got a lease that's running out. In other words, the people can walk. Panera doesn't have to renew, but they have an option that they can renew. And whenever you get a property that you can buy in a situation like that it's just like you said if there's 10 years left on the lease uh you'll get a you'll get a premium for it in fact right now starbucks they'll build a brand new starbucks and they're trying to sell those at a four percent and a four and a half percent cap which i would never touch it would never be worth it to me but uh but like I say, when you start running out and there's a you know less than a year left and they may or may not renew then this is what you get the sellers offer a much more uh you know lucrative uh, leasing situation. In other words, a, a higher cap rate, but it's because they're also fearful that they won't renew and they may, they may move on. So, and of course, as a landlord, you got the same concern, you know, you, you, you buy a Panera bread and all of a sudden it's empty, then, you know, it's, you got to find somebody else that'll fit, fit in there similarly. Uh, and they all have their own protocol for, you know, the line that they do in the kitchen and everything else. So it, it can be a tough road to get a, that kind of a building re-rented to somebody new from a completely different business. But sometimes once in a while, it's kind of nice. They can walk in and they can kind of utilize what's there, but they still got to change all the art. There's a lot to work to do no, in any event. We'll keep watching. And that's pretty much all you need. Clean title, phase one, survey, roof inspection, electrical inspection, and now you know your asset is safe. It's going to be there for a long time. So like that phase one, what he's talking about a phase one, that's general requirement. And that's just, they just, looking for asbestos in the ceiling, the wall, the tile, something like that. And generally that flies in general. Most of that stuff, as long as you don't remove it, it's fine. As long as it's covered with paint, it's fine. Uh, a phase one isn't bad, but when a phase one causes you, or they call out to have a phase two, and I'll give you an example. Let's say they had a dry cleaner in there. If they had a dry cleaner in there, well, the dry cleaners deal with a lot of caustic chemicals and it becomes an immediate concern of any lender. They want to know if there's chemicals, you know, seeped into a pit, you know, is in the ground because you can end up getting into different kinds of lawsuits. If you contaminate the ground or the groundwater, it can be a big deal. So uh, ideally, your phase one doesn't recommend or call out for a phase two, which if it did, I guarantee it, the bank, that ever, whatever bank would look at this, uh, if a phase one calls out for a phase two to be done, which costs about 10 times more, you know, you can get away with a thousand to two thousand dollars on the phase one, but a phase two is going to be doing core samples in the ground, that sort of thing. So it costs a lot more. So, uh, uh, you know, but if, if, if it was in the phase one, the bank would not finance it for him. But let's keep watching. 
I feel like this is going to be a good property. It's in an awesome location. I mean, you got a lake behind you. You got brand new condos. This is what people want. So you guys tell me. I'm out here sweating my balls off to teach you guys something, to show you guys something. Let me know. But I figured today we get out here and show you, you know, some, some nitty gritty of real estate and show you some, some tips and tricks on how to buy and purchase triple net real estate. So actually, I got to tell you something. Uh, I think Ben Sr. is a real smart guy for sure. And I know I already know he's done tons of business. But Ben Jr. there, man, but just by osmosis, he's learned a hell of a lot. Uh, you know, he, this is probably, and I haven't watched every Ben Mala video by any means, but I'll tell you what, this is one of probably, it's one of the, if it's not the, it's probably the most informative uh, video I've ever seen so far. Uh, because it's right to the point of stuff that's very important. And uh, so, yeah, good for you. Uh, this is a this is a good one. I think it's one of the best videos you guys have made so far, uh, just because you're kind of getting to stuff that's very important. And I mean, it's it's one thing to look at properties and and joke and and you know and the things that you guys do, which it's you know it's all interesting. But this is very much to uh, some very pertinent, important stuff uh, for any investor that's going to buy. So good job, good job. Let's keep watching. Panera Bread was a lot of dough. Why don't you read the newspapers? Did you see the article on it? it? What did it say? So you have to explain that. I got to explain. Buyers and sellers combined closing statement. Summary of buyer's transaction. Summary of seller's transaction. It's split in half. We got county taxes. These are credits. So I had a deposit down. They got to give me credit for the first year of the... Uh, you know, the first part of the year of taxes that he owned it, I got to get a credit for that because I got to pay the tax bill for 2021 at the end of 2021. So he gives me the part that he ran up on the tax bill and then I'll pay the difference. So what he's, show, he's looking at is what we call a closing statement. They also refer to it as a HUD, a HUD statement. And basically it's got the seller and the buyers, the credits to go back and forth, the purchase price. You know, if they've already, uh, they get tax prorations. If you're buying a property that's a year into the tax year uh, or half a year into the tax year, then basically the seller owes you half a year of tax uh, taxes, whatever, you know, on, on whatever the value of the property is. You pay them the taxes in, in arrears. So at the end of the year, you pay what last year's taxes were beginning December, you know, 1st or January 1st. So that's what he's going through on that. And uh, let's, let's hear the rest of it. Security deposits, $20,400. We all know what that is. Tenants got security deposits. Okay. So that's another thing. Whenever you transfer a property like this, uh, they have what they call estoppel certificates. Estoppels are basically a signed statement that you have e as a seller. I would have each of my tenants sign that says, yes, the lease. In other words, they might even have the lease you know, stapled to the back of the estoppel that says, yes, this, the, 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 the lease is as agreed. So in other words, when you sell a property and you're showing somebody that, yeah, there's a lease here, there's two years left, they got a thousand dollar deposit. Uh, you know, that sort of thing. You want to have all that clarified because in the end, on the closing statement, you want to have all those deposits that the, the guy you're buying it from, the seller, you want to make sure all those deposits transfer to you, but also you want to make sure that there's no side agreements or that there's nothing that isn't it fully disclosed, meaning that the, the leases are what they say. And that's what an estoppel certificate is. It basically reaffirms that the, the, the tenant in the building is reaffirming that, yeah, the lease is as agreed. This is what, you know, my rent is X and my deposit is X and that's understood. And the term left is, you know, X. And uh, that way you just a way of getting a little more comfort, making sure that tenants are going to stay or that you can get rid of one if you want to after a certain amount of time. You know, some people buy a building. And they plan on getting rid of half of the tenants because they're going to take half the building for their own business. You never know. So uh, let's keep watching. May rent. May 3rd through May 31st. It was prorated. So we received all the rent that he collected at the beginning of May. He gave us credit for that, a 42,155.83. So he said 42,000. Uh, so you do the math on that. 42,000 times 12, you got 480,000 plus. 24. So he's getting about 500. So that's interesting. So he's getting $502,000 a year uh, gross income on this thing. And uh, the building I just bought for, uh, it was a th they were asking 3 point, 3 point something. Anyway, I ended up getting it for 2.7 million, 2.73, I think, which is almost exactly half. 
and I'm getting two hundred and sixty thousand uh, dollars a year uh, gross rents. So I'm getting two sixty. He's getting just just a little less than that. I mean, a little less than double, and he's paying just about double. So, yeah, it sounds like our numbers are pretty close. We bought it for five million three. <coughs> we bought it because we were told and believe that it's going to give us a six and a half cap. $344,500 a year. Five million three times 80%. We're gonna have a loan on it for $4,240,000. I know I'm gonna get it for two and a half percent. I'll tell you what, two and a half percent loan, he's getting, he's got, that's a hell of an interest rate. I, I can't get that. Uh, I gotta look more into uh, what he's doing. I may have to do a consult Ben call because I don't know how he's getting two and a half percent. But uh, regardless, 20% down, I'm not comfortable having, I'd, I'd rather put a little more than 20% down myself. I like a little more, a little more room, but of course with a two and a half percent interest rate, he actually can afford to, uh, he can afford to deal with uh, only 20% down because he's really, he's got, he's got that interest down really low. I'm impressed. That's $106,000 a year in interest and I'm going to get interest only. We said the property is going to make 344 minus 106 equals $238,000. We're going to get $238,000 a year in income. We paid 5.3 times 20%. 1,060,000 is going to give me $238,000 a year. 1,060,000 a year. Shit, that's like more than 20%. All right? Give or take. I got a cushion there at 20%. All right? If you get, if you're at, get more than 20%, you're a greedy. You know, 20% is, is, is good. That's the story. Simple, clean. If the purchase price is a million dollars and you got a six and a half cap, you get $65,000 a year in income. Now, you go out and use most of the bank's money at, all right, I get really great rates, but even if you get a four, you're still gonna be making 15% return on your money. That's what you do. That's the only game right now. Everything else is overpriced. So what he's doing, I was thrown for a minute, but what I wasn't sure what numbers I was hearing him crunch, but what he's basically doing is he's talking about taking uh, the cash that you use to pay on the property. Uh, like he said, if you put a million dollars, paid a million dollars cash, you're getting you know, $65,000 a year on it. In his case, he's kind of doing that. He's buying a $5 million property and he's putting 1 million down, 20% roughly. So he's going to get $65,000 on his million. Okay. Then on the other 4 million, he's going to get six and a half percent, but he's borrowing at two and a half percent. So he's going to make 4% on his other four million, which is another hundred and sixty thousand, so he's going to get one hundred and sixty thousand dollars clear. That's what he's going to clear. So think about that. He's got uh, uh, he's got two hundred and twenty five thousand dollars a year roughly coming in uh, on his million dollars, and that's where he come up with that twenty something percent uh, on his million. That's what basically it's, he's making twenty percent on cash on cash. So let's keep watching. Buying triple nets? Would you buy triple net outside Florida? You know, if I can't find a deal in Florida and I got to start looking, then I will. If I get desperate enough, I will. If it's an out of the park deal, I will. But I prefer not. I want to be close, okay? At least a short plane ride away. Yeah, you, you really do want to be close. I mean, I, listen, I can walk. I've got 150,000 square feet of rentals, maybe a little bit more right now. And I buy another 30,000 square feet of stuff that I'm flipping. I can walk to all of it. I mean, there's probably nothing I couldn't walk to walking i could get there in two hours everything that i have uh and some of it i can be there in 10 minutes i got a lot of stuff very close by uh so it's it's very important to be near your assets if you want to be a good manager if you want to make sure that things are taken care of uh if you're away you get a bad manager and they're telling you one thing and something else is going on and you can't really you can't be there to see it you don't know so it's and if you are going to be an out of town uh you know an absentee you know, owner, absentee manager, then I urge you to have some rapport with all of your tenants so that your tenants will call you if the manager's doing something wrong. Because most management agreements that you get into, you're responsible for all the crap that that manager gets into. You'll be paying for his lawyer if he does something wrong. So anyways, I'm with Ben. Keep it close. You know, handle your own. I, and again, I don't jump out of town unless it's a stupendous deal. And and then it would usually be a short-term flip. Adios, amigos. So, yeah, that was a, a really, that was one of the best videos I think I've ever seen Ben Mala put out. Uh, and it was nice seeing Junior in there, you know, on the property. This is what I do all the time. Uh, so I appreciate it. I haven't seen much of that coming out of uh, Ben Mala Station. But I think that was, uh, uh, it was valuable. 
Okay, it's one thing to talk about it, but it's another level to go out there and, and actually just take people through it, which is what I do all the time. So if you don't have my book, I have a book, Wake Up and Smell the Real Estate. Uh, it's been a bestseller on Amazon and Kindle and Audible. And uh, also I have a mentorship uh, at FlipAnythingUSA.com. Uh, you go to FlipAnythingUSA.com, you'll find the mentorship there. I've already had my first millionaire after one, after one year, after one year, I've already got a millionaire on the class and I, I've got two guys that are right on his heels. I'll probably have three millionaires here within the next six months and, uh, and who knows, maybe even more, but I've got a lot of other people that have just made, you know, made 10,000, 20,000, a hundred thousand. So, you know, it, it just gets started. There's nothing better, you know, been like myself, been an investor for a very long time. There's not, really not a better vehicle to get rich in real estate. But uh, hey, good job, uh, Ben and Ben Jr. I think that's Ben Jr. I think it is. Uh, but uh, great job. Really, really, uh, I think it's one of your finest videos. Uh, so hey, I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, please subscribe to the channel. Uh, I've been doing this a long time. And, uh, you know, I'll call out a fake guru. But likewise, I'll praise praise a good guy like when I see it like these two guys are. Please uh, like the channel, subscribe if you would. And uh, I'd love your comments, good or bad. I'd love to hear what you, you anything you got a problem with or something you want to see differently. Just uh, say so. Thanks a lot. Bye. So it's, it's really a perfect storm for making money in that respect. But in one year, his portfolio has gone from, from zero to $1.6 million. What do you got, 30, 22? Yeah, I think I got 27, yeah. 27 properties, yeah, 27 properties. John, you have to buy that. That is a great property. I just closed on two houses yesterday. It's worth 250, I bought that one for 170. My first millionaire, my first millionaire <laughs> student. I don't wanna screw around. I don't wanna play games going back and forth. What is the absolute bottom dollar? And I'll tell you if I'm gonna buy it or not.